As a disclaimer, um, I should uh, probably say that um, preparing for this uh, symposium, I did a lot of reading and um, I talked to many people about the subject. And in the end, I just um, ended up really overwhelmed by, um, by the concept. And so I take the liberty of being a poet, a bit uh, jumbled, a bit uh, chaotic. Um, I, I, I hopefully uh, don't, um, I, 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 I hope I won't make uh, poets look bad. Um, the, pro uh, the problem with beauty, I feel, these days is that the pressure on people, um, regular people, not only artists, uh, is very high. Um, it, it, we're pressurized to uh, perceive beauty all the time, to sense beauty and obviously be beautiful a lot of the time. And uh, the problem with that is it, uh, it becomes something else than beauty. It becomes kind of a good enough niceness that we're trying to achieve. Even um, hardcore intellectuals find themselves sometimes scrolling away on Instagram and uh, being connected to the appearances of um, what we perceive as beautiful, for example, um, beautiful places on Earth and everything. And uh, when beauty becomes marketable and um, weaponized against pe people uh, with less privileges or uh, fewer resources, then uh, we uh, move away from the actual beauty and this uh, can um, sabotage beauty itself because it, it it might make people um, move away from beauty, uh, deny beauty, and uh, uh, in the time where a regular person doesn't have enough time to read or uh, visit exhibitions, uh, there can be, in an optimistic way, the um, rise of something like anti-aesthetic movement or new aesthetics, but it can end up with uh, simple cynicism. For example, um, trying to Google beauty, uh, probably like five first pages of pictures are of uh, beautiful women. And uh, the problem with that is um, It can, it can um, become a weapon against people who don't have the time or the resources to be beautiful all the time. But the desire of, for beauty and the need, the actual need for beauty is, uh, I think, very relevant in all of us. Uh, because beauty and not the appearances that we're used to is what gives meaning to our otherwise empty and meaningless existence. And uh, when you can't access the sense of beauty, you become cynical, uh, self-destructive or destructive. And I argue that we are living in a time where beauty is actually really scarce, because beauty needs time and a spe uh, special mindset, which is hard to achieve when you're in a rut of going to work, working nine to five, picking up children from kindergarten, preparing dinners, and so on. I, I have to um, say I used to work in theater, and um, now for a few years I've been uh, uh, living in the regular workers' life uh, in a print house. So my relationship with beauty has greatly changed due to me seeing the life of regular people, so to say. I argue that people uh, usually have um, kind of a way of thinking. For example, there are people who tend to think like philosophers and there are people who tend to think like, say, marketers or like politicians or lovers or artists. Uh, it 
uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they are philosophers or artists. Uh, it just uh, kind of uh, defines the way they solve problems and think. And very simplistically, I would say there is kind of uh, the mindset or a think way of thinking that is positivistic, optimistic, uh, going forward, uh, creating something, being uh, optimistic about it. And then there's the kind of thinking that I would uh, describe as the thinking of a poet, which is kind of pessimistic, uh, describing, observing human condition uh, instead of uh, uh, giving the positive program. And uh, in that way of thinking, beauty is not something uh, objective, usually. It's the small errors in our flow of life, the, the um, falling out of normality, in a way. Uh, usually, or often, uh, it is um, depressing. Um, but um, I believe that way of thinking, when combined with a positive idea of uh, beauty, is actually really relevant. A poet works with words that cost nothing. Uh, a poet um, creates something that, if it fails, nobody gets killed. Um, the beauty a poet can create in otherwise stable or trying to be a stable normal world is uh, create shifting meanings and uh, mm, that can, for a perceiver, give a way of seeing things through the scale of universe or infinity, in a way. And I think this is what is relevant for our souls, um, our uh, feeling or uh, dealing with life. The poetic thought is an invisible aspect to fill otherwise optimistic concept of pleasure, niceness, stability, what we're all searching for. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, it won't let us forget that uh, we are um, people stuck in a uh, slowly mo moving towards illnesses and death and destruction. But uh, the beauty of that is it shouldn't be depressing. It should actually be optimistic, calming, uh, and reminding us that the people who don't have resources, who take their buses to work every day and then back and uh, deal with groceries and everything, there are people who have this privilege. Uh, they have time. They have the mindset. We call them artists uh, in a general uh, way. And I say that... This is the. Um, this is what so-called beauty operators should cooperate and do uh, to help each other with the resources we have. We ha we don't have money, but we have the time to actually perceive things, to think about things. And uh, I, I believe these people, beauty operators, I say, the writers, actors, filmmakers, architects, are respons responsible for, uh, for creating physical and mental spaces that uh, should allow regular people uh, be in contact with the true beauty, not just the appearances or what we should perceive as beautiful. How to do that? Um, I'm not sure, but... Um, as, as soon as uh, the concept of beauty becomes marketable or uh, is excluding some people or some groups, then uh, this, is, this isn't beauty anymore. And I, I think we should always remember that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, do you want to hear me? So, do you hear me? Uh, uh, look at the name again. I named my talk a bit differently. I mean, it's a subtitle. Can you live without beauty? And I would add, um, while Mar uh, Maria, right? Sorry. Oh, Maria. M sorry? M Marielle. 
Lovely. Okay. <laughs> uh, was speaking, uh, I thought that it goes well with two other questions. Can you live without humor? Can you live without poetry? And the answer to all three questions, I think, is no. Uh, you think that many people live without poetry, but that's not, that's not true. Go to the market and hear metaphors. You need metaphors in life. And humor, even in the, as everybody knows, even in the hardest times, you do use uh, jokes. And there is a connection between these three questions, just as there is a connection between these two, these three big riddles that have been written philosophy. I don't think they are philosophical problems, by the way. I think they are psychological problems. What is a poem? What is beauty? What is humor? Uh, there is a connection between all these, among all of these three, and I'll try. I'll even tell you the solution then, the eventual solution. And the, my answer, why beauty, humor, and poetry are so important, and the secret red will sound a bit strange for you at this stage, but I hope to make it less strange later, change. We all want to change, I mean, and it's very, very hard to change because we all act all the time. And when we act, we operate our motives, our ordinary motives. If you want to change, and it's important to change because it's important to develop, you have to stop yourself. You have to have some means of not doing what you want and have some switch in your way. Well, I'm sure this is all mysterious for you. I'll try to make it a bit less mysterious, so, okay. So, the, the title is that beauty, like humor, is not a luxury. It's a necessity in life. And uh, let me tell you, uh, for example, what uh, Herman Weil, a well-known mathematician, said about his, the uh, factor of beauty, the, the role of beauty in his work, he said that beauty, this is, everybody repeats it, this is a criterion for truth. If you don't, if the idea is beautiful, it must fit. Uh, and why is it so? Because in the natural sciences, uh, beauty is the best indication for truth for the following reason, that uh, the world is economical for some mysterious reason, the laws governing the world are short. E equals mc squared. Can anything be shorter than that? And uh, beauty is really concentrated, so it's conciseness. It's, it explains in concise ways uh, the rule, the laws of the world. So if we know, if it somehow fits well with simplicity, it means, which is what is beauty is in the sciences, uh, it means that it's probably correct. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'm just repeating what I said in last time, that beauty is finding some hidden order. Uh, let me just quote here some mathematicians who speak about this. So Hardy said that there is no place on earth or even for ugly mathematics. Uh, and there was a very famous mathematician called Paul Erdes, who was an eccentric guy known for his eccentricities. Uh, and he claimed that in, in heaven there is a book Containing all the most beautiful proofs for every, all the, the most beautiful proof for every theorem. And in one of his talks, somebody came to him after the talk and asked him, "Where can I get that book?" Uh, so, and again, something about poetry and beauty. Kafka claimed that poetry is always search for the truth. There is something on the um, on the surface. It doesn't look like searching for the truth, but beneath it, there is some truth. I think that's why poets write poems, and you'll tell us perhaps later. Uh, poets write poems in order to decipher, to discover their own inner truth. So the, when a poet write a poem, writes a poem, the poem writes, it, it writes the poet. I mean, he doesn't know what is going to be written. I think so. You'll tell us later. Okay. Uh, so. Poetry has devices for circumventing conscious truth, a conscious thought. Okay, let me, I think next one is, uh, okay, no, how do I go back? Never mind. So, uh, 
There is a saying of Thomas Beecham, perhaps I'll say it later, I'll show it later. Why is music important? Because it's a way to circumvent the tyranny of conscious thought. So uh, you hear it and you don't know what's happening there. You absorb everything unconsciously. Uh, Okay, yeah, that's what, that's the next slide. The role of uh, music is to release us from the tyranny of conscious thought. Let's see. Uh, so, what I'm claiming is that uh, beauty, as well as humor in a very different way, but definitely poetry, is a way to liberate us from our wishes and so the slavery to wishes and intentions. Uh, let me say something a bit surprising, but uh, why are all people cl why are old people wise? Well, how come wisdom comes with old age? So everybody will answer experience. I think the answer it's not the entire answer. The real answer is the following: with old age, I can testify, you you want things less. Okay, wishes the the desires go down. The wishes. And therefore, you are not, no longer a slave to your personality, to your wishes, to your, and you can see things more clearly. And what beauty and poetry do is that they give you this prize, this little present, without having to be old. Okay? Uh, so, uh, let, let us, I, I, this is something new that I was thinking about just when I repair this talk. Why are swans so beautiful? Well, the neck is really beautiful, but their uh, motion is aristocratic. You think that their motions are uh, beautiful. And the reason is that it is as if detached from intention. You don't see, you don't see their feet move in the water, and they are sliding like this without intention. So if you detach your uh, actions from intention, then it's beautiful. Uh, it can be beautiful. There, there was a, a Russian uh, philosopher or th uh, theoretician of theater called Shklovsky, who defined, who invented a notion called estrangement. So he claimed that art, the, the function of art is estrangement. What does it mean? It takes something that you know very well and makes it strange for you, something new. You look at it in a completely different way. You detach it from the old uh, perceptions and the old also wishes. So, uh, and this way, this new look that you have at the world is the way to change. So, uh, this is something that somebody called some writer, American writer, American Chinese writer called Lin Yu Tang said about humor. He said that humor is the way to change our thoughts. That's the function of humor. What is, why is it? Because humor uh, detaches notions, detaches some meanings, some carriers of meaning from the meaning. Let me give you an example again of old age. Men, old men A say to old men B, uh, do you remember how we used to chase girls? And old man B says, yes, but I don't remember why. Okay, so uh, it's detachment of the desire from the object. So this is what happens in humor in general. When you detach, you can act in a new way. So what happens in beauty, as I told you, is that you perceive it unconsciously. And uh, therefore, when you don't operate your conscious thought, that's what Beecham said, when you don't operate your conscious thought, you can act differently, you can change whatever you have in the mechanisms of perceptions in your mind. So, say, Picasso changed our way we see things. Musicians change our way, change the way we hear things. Uh, and I think I will finish here, a minute before time, but finished what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Ron.
and very uh, you worded burning. everything so beautifully and Sorry? Uh, you, you worded everything so beautifully Thank and you. Uh, I agree with and, um, uh, I must say I was always eager to interview a, a, a poetess or poet so this is my chance right <laughs> <laughs> yes. could you tell us for, ex for example who writes the poem you or the poem Sorry? who writes the poem you or the poem does the poem come to you or do you have no. to work hard? No, it doesn't. I think it's, uh, with all arts, um, you are, if, um, you can con uh, construct that something, and then it doesn't have actually the, the connection to the upper knowledge or something. When uh, I, I've seen like actors uh, on stage, they're not them, it's, it's the, the other what? thing. Sorry? Hmm? The actors are not what? Uh, I mean, well, uh, when a poet writes a poem, yes. it's not the poet's poem, it's the universe's poem. Uh -huh. yeah. If it's any good. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it's just. It you know, expresses some universal truth or some personal truth? I think so, because it, uh, I think all arts are uh, detached from the pe person, actually, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a shame that we're, we're living in an age where um, the. Actor, uh, the, the one that acts, the one that, that writes or creates something is so um, important, important uh -huh. because... Uh, but it was always like that. I mean, poets were always admired and uh, it's very hard. I, I don't understand how a poet can write when he knows that the next day somebody will read it and either admire it or criticize it. it does, does it work for me? I mean, do, when you write, aren't you afraid of people looking at it and seeing whatever is in your mind and... Uh, uh, going deep into your mind and uh, well, uh, of of course. I mean, uh, it's the death of the author. Uh, Sorry, death of the death uh -huh. of the author, um, and uh, all kinds of artists and writers and poets tend to be really sensitive people uh, and uh, very sensitive to criticism, obviously. But uh, I think um, it's uh, you can if you publish something you put it away and it's, it's no longer yours. yours. Uh -huh. uh, and if people want to read into something um, and uh, uh, conclude something about you as a person, then it's their problem because, uh, really? uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I must, I'll tell you something from my own experience. Uh, three months before my first child was born, I don't know how, I started writing poetry. I can tell you how. <laughs> I was swimming in the pool and I hear, heard something through the water in my ears. I heard something that I, was not this. Uh, was a, a sad and true and, and a real angel something. I thought that's poetry, so I wrote it down and it continued to a, a poem. And then for half a year, that's all I did, writing poetry. And then I published two, two of these in a newspaper and since then, I, cannot, I couldn't even dream of writing because it is suddenly in the public, in the eyes of the public, and everybody can see, what, can see what, what's going on in my mind. No, no way, I don't want that. Doesn't it disturb you? Well, uh, to, uh, to be honest, my last uh, book was published in 2012, uh -huh. and since then, I've wrote, uh, written some, but I haven't published anything. And I wouldn't really, um, I don't think poets uh, or people who have published poetry are that important, kind of. Uh, there are stages in life when you want to write poetry and stages when you want to go deep into, I don't know, uh, research uh, astrophysics and see what's going on there. And, uh, and you, it doesn't define you in a way. Oh. It's liberating. So how would you be... define, when is it that you want to write poetry? When does it happen to you? Um, when you suffer? To me, it's... Uh, no, no, oh. not definitely. It's, um, like, as I said, uh, these days I see a lot of people who, who don't have time for anything, uh -huh. and they, they're just in the rut, and so am I, in a way. But when it happens that you get the time to, for example, just take a walk uh -huh. and be alone and uh, think about things, or the... And All the um, information that has settled in you, you kind uh -huh. of try to order or, or organize it. Um, then so you see some structure in the world and you want to, to say something about it, or you, see, you perceive something totally new that nobody ever thought of, some nice 
uh, analogy between things and nice metaphor. That's what happens when you... Well, yeah, it's, I think it's all the information, whatever kind of information uh, from American politics or uh, what, whether it is, it kind of uh, collects itself. And at some point you have to, in your brain... Uh, Give it form. Yes, because it's all so messy. Uh -huh. You have to organize it. Uh -huh. And for a poet, it's probably a way of metaphors, like you said, or, or uh, for engineers, it's kind of like putting it on paper and, you know, uh -huh. because, yes. So engineering need... is poetry. Hmm? Engineering can be poetry. I, I think so, yeah. yes. Yes, I agree with you. So when it all falls into place, that's what we said about mathematics, when suddenly you see things fit together and the metaphors fit the, the object. Yeah? Okay. But does, doesn't it... Uh, so for me, for example, it was clear why afterwards, it was clear why I was writing poetry, because this, uh, the birth of my first child awoke uh, reminiscences, uh, memories of my own childhood, which caused me, and I wanted to organize them. Indeed, this is the right word now that you're saying it. I wanted to, to put them into form. Mm -hmm. it, this was unconscious, and I wanted to write up what was going to happen. A lot of new feelings, fears, uh, everything. But, yeah, yes, you have but this to... Was, it came from very deep things that I wanted to put... I mean, I was, it was not clear at all to me why I wrote this. But looking back, it was because uh, I had to give form, that's what you were saying, to something deep, to something... Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe that we, are, uh, we all have so many thoughts in us, and mm -hmm. only a little fraction is uh, words, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you, living in, in the age where re reading or it, it's so important, you can't access the feelings that don't have words. So mm -hmm. at some point so you have to either visualize them uh, in art, for example, or uh, put words to them. It, it's never Visualization exhausting. words, visualizing words, I mean, images. Exactly. Right. Just to access and deal with the mess that we are made of, Yes. I think. And the images are indirect. That's very important. The image doesn't tell you. So uh, this is something in general about literature. If, say, a little story wrote about Natasha, I mean, War and Peace, that she was, she was a naive girl, she was, I don't know, ABC. This wouldn't be literature. You have to give an image and you have to reduce it. You have not to know it explicitly. So art is never explicit, just like humor is never explicit. And poetry is the, the epitome of non-explicitness, right? Say things through images, through metaphors, uh, through things that you don't really understand fully. Not, neither the reader nor the writer. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. so Once you, uh, you understand exactly what you're saying and the reader, uh, it, then it doesn't have to be a poet, it's an article, yes. and you can publish it right. in uh, a magazine. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So, really, what I was, this, uh, let me return to the starting point. For me, a poem writes itself. I mean, you don't know, you don't consciously know what's going to happen. It exactly, tells you, exactly. And it tells you things about yourself that you didn't know before, I think so. No? Exactly. And yourself. obviously, it has changed because. Uh, um, uh, sometime before there were very strict rules for poetry, like verses and everything. Uh -huh. But since the uh, rise of blank verse, it's kind of more intuitive, and uh -huh. uh, to me it's... There is still meter, usually. I think you can decipher meter in, in most... Uh, it uh, is very poems. relevant, obviously, because it, it, it gives form to yes. the words and kind of like structures the meaning. Uh, but uh, I don't think, like, very specific poets who, who have very great rules for sonnets or something, mm -hmm. often if you pay too much attention to the form mm -hmm. and perfect it, no, the uh, it loses the The greatest actual... ones, for the greatest, it comes naturally. And actually it releases you. Probably, yeah. It yes. releases you because uh, you have to write, uh, you have to stick to the form, to the verse. And uh, it makes your your thoughts unconsciously fit it, so you, you less you control less the thought, and you mm -hmm. uh, do the verse and meter yes. 
uh, intuitively it comes naturally, just like for Mozart, it was totally intuitive to write and he didn't have to make any effort for the greatest, I think. It is, I know it's in Hebrew poetry, I don't know much about other poetry. The greatest poets wrote in rhymes. Absolutely. And, uh, and in, in that way, I, I just, uh, I always feel a bit, bit strange if somebody uh, thinks I'm a poet, because uh, in that way I am not, I'm just uh -huh. uh, wording something, and uh, in today's world everybody's a poet, because most everybody has published something. <laughs> right. right. Um, so it's, it's kind of strange or, or for me to, yes. to talk for, okay. yeah, <laughs> on the poet. Thank you, we have to wrap it up, I'm sorry. Okay. I can listen to you a lot more and much longer, and uh, Thank you. it's uh, Thank you. one o'clock. And it just reminds me that when I read at the time uh, Susan Zontag's book Against Interpretation, she said that one of the quotes, Susan forgot who she quoted, said, believe the tale, not the teller, or something like uh -huh, that. Okay. So, yeah. yes, thank you very much. I was just asked to announce that at uh, quarter past one, uh, there is a ABB kind of uh, conversation organized. Uh, the title is, Are You Still in charge, how smart technologies change the perspective of architecture. So if you're interested in even more, it's 115. Thank you very much. In the, in the, where is it? Did they all know? Yes, it's over there. Thank you very much. And we will continue to look. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.